You're listening to the Legal Talk Network. Hello, I'm Bob Ambrogi. And I'm Monica Bay. We've been writing about law and technology for more than 30 years. That's right. During that time, we've witnessed many changes and innovations. Technology is improving the practice of law, helping lawyers deliver their services faster and cheaper. Which benefits not only lawyers and their clients, but everyone. And moves us closer to the goal of access to justice for all. Tune in every month as we explore the new legal technology and the people behind the tech here on Law Technology Now. Welcome to Law Technology Now, and welcome to Jeffrey Brandt. Thank you, Monica. Before we get started, we would like to thank our sponsor, Thomson Reuters. It's demystifying artificial intelligence will be done in seven single steps. AI will create change, but managing change doesn't just happen. Visit LegalSolutions.com slash AI to learn more. Let's start with your job in West Virginia and your role at Pinhawk Law. Well, I am the Chief Information Officer at Jackson Kelly. We're a regional law firm, about 200 attorneys, 12 offices, domestic U.S., uh, pretty full-featured practice. Pretty much anything that deals with technology, plugs, data is ultimately my responsibility. On the Pinhawk side, my role is the editor of the Law Technology Daily Digest. It's a free newsletter that comes out. I believe our subscribership is somewhere 16, 17,000 people at this point. I take a number of different sources of materials, about 500 different news sources, and identify the top news articles and write some commentary and highlights each day. How do you mix those two? Well, it's, it's funny, actually. Uh, I started doing the Pinhawk when I was consulting, had my own private consulting practice. And so for me, it uh, was a fun thing to do and actually served as a, a marketing vehicle for me. But today, uh, when I joined, uh, was asked to join Jackson Kelly, part of what they knew me from was the Pinhawk uh, and the, the Digest and so on. So I um, talked to them about how we were going to deal with that, whether I needed to turn it over to a different editor. And they said, well, we really would like you to continue. We think that there's a lot of value in you reviewing those you know, 500 sources of news every day in terms of looking at strategically and tactically how to best move Jackson Kelly forward. So it's been uh, quite a ride. It's, it's been a fun thing to do. And Jackson Kelly has fully endorsed. And so I continue to do that. I get up at 5, 5.30 in the morning. I get the newsletter out and come to work uh, to my real job. That's fantastic. And I'm one of the people who loves yours when I use it all the time. Well, thank you. Sure. Tell us a little bit more, though, about what your work is and how you balance that between those and also, which we're going to get to a little bit later, the various things you're involved with with some of the organizations. Well, at Jackson Kelly, uh, we needed to make some change. Uh, the the elevator speech, if, I, if you will, that I've been giving our attorneys is that we are looking to move IT out of the plumbing business and back into the business and the practice of law. We did a lot of cloud services, a lot of outsourcing, and quite frankly, uh, you know, as much as the firm loves the IT group, they're not going to double my staff. So we've been looking at automation and outsourcing, as I said, as well as some cloud services to try and reduce the amount of time we spend on the plumbing. You know, the plumbing is important. Infrastructure is important. Don't get me wrong. But ultimately, IT departments that get wrapped up into being nothing but the next upgrade, there's not a lot of return on investment for the partnership. I mean, for all intents and purposes, the partners don't care whether you're operating on Windows 7 or uh, Windows 10 or Office 2010 or Office 365. Uh, it really comes down to, you know, what percentage of the tools you're using. 
so, you know, the, the again, part of my elevator speech, the, the, the hypothetical law firm uses maybe 20%, 25% of Microsoft Word as an example. And so every time you do an upgrade, you know, you dip a bit and then you come back up and basically you're using that same 20%. It's our goal to try and insert ourselves and partner with the practices so that we can begin to push that forward from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50% so that we can really be doing meaningful projects that not only benefit our lawyers, but benefit the clients of the firm as well. That's really fascinating, especially because a lot of big law firms are too difficult to get those sorts of opportunities. Is there anything else special about that, that to being where you are and so forth and so on? I'm really fascinated by what you're doing. Well, we're certainly not the first firm that has gone Office 365 or Azure or anything else, but I think it's something, the difference might be that you know, we do set ourselves apart in that it is our overarching theme. So we have taken deliberate steps all within that same theme. We got rid of our on-prem document management system, went with NetDocs, and so we shed a lot of responsibilities, picked up a lot of great service and uh, other things as part of that. Uh, when we moved to Azure, we got rid of certain server maintenance and so on as part of that. Mimecast works really well for us. We're outsourcing to AlphaServe some services. We're looking to get security uh, and get some better responsiveness and greater depth of bench by doing some outsourcing. I'm a huge fan of Intap's uh, tools to automate. And so, you know, what used to take uh, three or four people on my staff hours to do, we're now trying to do in seconds uh, through automation. So I think it's really the combination of all those things coming together that really is going to let us move forward with the business and the practice of law instead of just working on the plumbing. Well, one of the things I'm noticing a lot is that artificial intelligence is just blooming. How do you use that, you know, and how does it help with better, faster, cheaper? Well, there's a lot of different things with artificial intelligence. It, it's uh, it's a fascinating subject. I've done a couple of presentations. I chaired a legal forum, legal IA, IA forum, in London last year, and I'm going to go back, going back again this year. Alt. I co-presented with Sally Gonzalez on the subject of artificial intelligence. The first thing is to really get rid of the hype and separate that from, what's the phrase, the, the, the wheat from the chafe. There's a lot of hype and a lot of misdirection around AI at this point. I mean, every vendor seems to want to be able to use AI or machine intelligence as part of their marketing efforts. And quite frankly, a lot of law firms are looking to ride those coattails as well and use it as a marketing effort. Artificial intelligence, I think, is very different than any technology that firms have implemented in the past. And by that, I mean that most technologies have been a bolt-on. So document management came along. It was a bolt-on to the way everything was done pretty much in a normal fashion. It augmented, but really didn't necessarily disrupt the way things were done. I think because of the cost, the care and feeding of artificial intelligence, that it is a tool that you have to look at and re-examine your staffing as part of that. You have to look in and say, okay, you know, I can do this faster, I can do this cheaper, but I need to change my staffing model, I need to change my workflows significantly as part of that. At Jackson Kelly, we're still looking at what the best tools might be for us and how we fit them in our culture. But I think it's going to be an interesting piece to see how it ultimately plays out. I mean, you still have, I was just reading a story this morning. So the Law Society of London is looking at judicial algorithms to help the judges there. And I contrast that with the ABA here in the United States continuing to fight organizations like LegalZoom over unauthorized practice of law. So it's going to be, uh, I think, a pretty amazing thing. Again, part of it is educating lawyers on the fact that you know, artificial intelligence is not what science fiction movies make it out to be. It can actually be pretty stupid. And so the care <laughs> and feeding that goes into that is fairly significant, and a lot of people will at least initially dismiss that. Yeah, it's really very, very hot right now. I'm, this is fascinating to me. You are very involved in several organizations, including Alt and ILTA. Let's start with the new one, the Association of Legal Technologists. 
We just call it ALT. It came out of some, I guess I'll call them disputes with uh, ILTA over how to best provide opportunities and enrichment and networking opportunities for members. Rick Hellers decided that there might be a better way to, at a certain point, go old school, but update it with some technology and so on. And so it was a, really just a different way at looking at providing network opportunities for the legal community. And I would argue that probably the biggest distinguishing factor is you know, who's a member, if you will. So at Alt, you could be a member as a member of a law firm, corporate law department, government legal agency, but you can also be a member as a vendor, as a consultant, as a client, general counsel, or, or someone in, in the you know, general corporation. And I think, to me, the epitome of that was shown at the premier conference. It was, uh, I forget exactly how many people, 200, 300 people, some, it wasn't huge, uh, but I was sitting in a room. I left the room, I think, three times, uh, once to go to the restroom, once to get some water, and I forget what the third one was. And, you know, again, there's a vendor display area, you know, kind of like a, a mini trade show area. And during the sessions, there was not a single vendor sitting outside at any of the desks or any of the booths. They were all involved in the conversation in the alt conference areas. So to me, that's a big, big difference. I mean, you go to any show, whether it's ILTA, whether it's uh, legal tech or anything else, and, you know, the trade show is fully manned and fully stocked. And, you know, there's kind of the members and law firm folks go to the sessions, the educational sessions, and then come out to talk about product or service or whatever it was. The level of conversation we had, so I was in a track that was, we were talking about design thinking, artificial intelligence was part of that in the session that Sally and I led. And so I'm sitting at a table with, I guess it was about nine other people, and the conversation we were having, because it wasn't just my peers, fellow technologists in a law firm, but the consultants and the general counsels and so on, the conversation we had was it's super intense. I mean, way better than anything I've had where it's just my peers. And I don't mean that as a cut on my peers. I've got great peers and, and some very smart people that that I network with. But the fact that you can have that full 360 degree conversation. Well, here's what we're doing as a law firm. The GC pipes up and says, well, that's why this is not going to work for us. Uh, or, you know, if I were you, uh, you know, the kinds of things that I look for in this are here. And then you've got the consultant saying, well, yeah, we're doing work with 50 different people and they're leaning more this way as opposed to this way. So I think the big thing with ALT is that full membership at the table that includes the vendors and consultant community. And I was there and it was really amazing. One of the things I never would have thought about is usually you get the thing you wear about with your name and all this other thing, and they put only your name and your first name. And your little one was, if it was there, it was very small. And it was amazing to me that it changed. I mean, because you know, as a journalist, I'm always looking to see who they are, what they are. And I'm going like, Monica, that's it? You know, it was something so simple that really blew out. I mean, everybody could talk to everyone and you weren't going, oh, no, I don't want to talk to her. She's a that, you know. Well, and it was designed that way on purpose to promote that networking, you know. My badge only said Jeff Brandt. So if you didn't know who Jeff Brandt was before that, you didn't know whether I was a vendor, a consultant, uh, with a corporation, with a law firm, or exactly what my role was. So you had to ask questions. You had to. So it was. It did. I, I like that piece as well. And I think it went really well. That just added to the whole conversation and networking piece at the Alt Conference. Absolutely. Yeah. It was very intense and very interesting. Moving on to ILTA, you have been very active there and something called Legal Sec, S-C-E-C. -E Tell us what your roles are there and what's going on there. And we're coming up on their big conference uh, very shortly. That's true. Uh, ILTACon is uh, in uh, mid to late August. So I've been a member, I mean, a lot of people don't necessarily know that uh, ILTA actually dates back to the Wang VS Legal Users Group. Uh, I was there, yes. <laughs> yeah. 
So that, that just gives you an appreciation for how old I am. But uh, I've took on a new role this year as one of the co-chairs for LegalSec. So LegalSec is a legal security summit. The summit is the conference that we put on. Pleasure to work with Rena Hunter and Peter Lesser, and between the three of us and an excellent committee of of dedicated members, the conference is all about security. It went off extremely well. We tried some different things this year, but it is ILTA's annual conference. I think it's the fifth year. I'm not 100% sure of that. Fourth or fifth year. And it is dedicated to raising security awareness and sharing everything security-related within the legal community. Security as in direct hardcore security, training and awareness, information governance. Uh, I mean, we had uh, three days, uh, if you include the the pre-summit workshop, uh, but three days of, of excellent content from really great speakers, all different kinds of security topics for the legal community. We're going to take a quick break to hear a message from our sponsor. Nowadays, there are as many definitions of artificial intelligence as there are companies trying to pitch AI solutions. So how do law firms know how and when to incorporate artificial intelligence? More and more law firms are starting to leverage AI across a broad range of applications. Legal research, litigation strategy, e-discovery, self-help online legal services, dispute resolution models, and contract review and analysis. Visit LegalSolutions.com forward slash AI to see how Thomson Reuters is helping legal professionals like you understand the impact and opportunities of this revolutionary technology and how to use it to deliver your best work faster and more accurately than ever. And we are back. So ILTACON 2018, which will be on August 19th through 23, is their major year-long one. Will you be involved with that? And is there any special thing that you're interested in this year? Yes, there's a lot of exciting things, I think, coming up with ILTACON. Uh, One of the things that I'm most excited to see is a young man session named uh, Marcus Weinberger. He gave a session at LegalSec that I was unable to see because I was shepherding a a different session at the same time. But uh, Marcus is a 15-year-old and gave a standing room only presentation on how to hack a law firm. Literally did live presentation using equipment that you probably threw away, you know, two or three years ago. Uh, it was very well received. It was fairly early in the in the morning, and uh, people were still talking about it at the end in the summary. But I think uh, the most exciting thing I'm going to do is see Marcus uh, hack at uh, Ilticon as well. Here's a question that I give quite a lot: eighty percent of Americans can neither find nor afford lawyers. What can we do to get this fixed? Well, it's a great question. I think that there is certainly an aspect of technology that can assist with that. I see a lot of things, uh, small apps and other things showing up, mostly in the United Kingdom and Australia. I think the, the big thing for us in the United States from the technology perspective and the marketing piece is to further educate the bars. I think that we need the bars to kind of get out of the way of some of these technologies coming forward so that more people can have a broader access. So I think certainly the aspect of getting technology involved in not only providing greater and wider access, uh, but also turnaround and so on to lawyers. I think there's a lot of lawyers out there that are certainly willing to help. It's a matter of connecting them with the people that need the help. I completely agree with you. Before we let you go, would you please tell our listeners how they can reach you? Well, I'm available at uh, jkbrandt at jacksonkelly.com. Jeffrey, thank you so much. This has been another edition of Law Technology Now on the Legal Talk 
Network. If you like what you heard today, please rate us at Apple Podcasts. Join us on the next edition of Law Technology Now. I'm Monica Bay, signing off. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.